Finally this morning we conclude our short series on Conor Cruz O'Brien, historian, diplomat, literary critic, academic, politician, journalist, who died recently. Well, uh, the uh, the intellectual in politics is, of course, uh, he's in, it is a difficult terrain uh, for him. It's one in which I think uh, he should be. Anyway. He was also a public intellectual, which is manifest from the RTE Sound Archive, where there are numerous controversial broadcasts by Conor Cruz O'Brien over the years. Some examples in a moment. When elected to the Dole in 1969, one of his controversial less travel, especially in Africa. Uh, well, now my only chance of uh, visiting Africa would be uh, during parliamentary recesses, uh, mm -hmm. at least during the next few years. But also among the Conor Cruz O'Brien tapes in Orte Sound Archives is this memorable encounter years later, after his political career was over, when he accepted the opportunity of visiting South Africa on a lecture tour from the Morning Ireland Archives. In the chair, David Davin Power. Well, one certainty for the quotes of the week column stands out this morning on the front page of the Irish Times. What ex-cabinet minister said, of whom, about what, stuff them, I'm not going to have my conscience run for me. Well, the two men involved are both Trinity College academics and present and past chairman of the anti-apartheid movement. One is Conor Cruz O'Brien, who's to go to South Africa on a lecturing assignment, and his protagonist is Kader Asmal, current IAAM chairman. Last night, Asmal described the assignment as an act of betrayal, to which O'Brien responded with the injunction to stuff it. Both, both men are with us now, Conor Cruz O'Brien on phone and Kader Asmal in studio. First of all, Dr. O'Brien, could I put to you that uh, your assignment is in clear breach of the many cultural boycotts that have been urged of South Africa? Yes, it is in clear breach of one that is being urged, uh, that is to say the uh, movement for an academic boycott uh, of scholars uh, and universities which are entirely blameless in the matter of a party uh, and indeed in many cases clearly and openly opposed to a party. Uh, I, I think that boycott is silly and unjust uh, and I'm happy to break it whoever commends it. Well, do, does it not sit a little uneasily with your previous espousal of the aims of the Irish anti-apartheid movement? It doesn't sit at all uneasily. When I became a sponsor of the uh, Irish anti-apartheid movement uh, back about nearly 30 years ago now, I guess, uh, this was uh, an open movement uh, run on liberal lines, and nobody at that time would have dreamed of boycotting. Uh, uh, scholars or universities. That simply would not have been on. Well, Kader if it is on now, I'm that. not with it. And yes. if, I were, if I am required in order to remain with the Irish anti-party movement to join in an academic boycott, I'm not doing it. Yeah. And uh, I would much rather resign or be put out of the anti-party. Kader Asmal. Well, uh, come off it, Dr. O'Brien. You became uh, chairman in 1970. In 1968, 150 Irish academics signed a declaration saying that they will not work. Well, I wasn't one South of them, Africa. Kader, and I would never be one of no, them. No, no, you may not have been one of it, but you were part of a movement that had openly uh, espoused and supported a campaign. Your idea of being part of a movement and mine are totally different. No, no, I'm you not have to look at it in a totalitarian no, theory, no, no, the no, movement nonsense. owns you. This is perverse. Your movement doesn't own me, Kader, and no, no, it never will. Please, don't ride high horses. This is a perverse argument. The argument is not whether to persecute individual academics in South Africa. Your listen, academics look quite about it. You seem incapable of understanding that an individual can make up his own mind. Of course. And is not governed by resolutions or pronunciamentos or letters signed by 150 or 50,000 people. Dr. O'Brien, I, I think your views is getting a little bit personal, if I may say. It often did on all sides. So nobody can say conclusively that the Irish press has pinned itself to anything. Except you. But I think I haven't said anything yet. I, I'm just pointing out the equivocal nature of much that appears. Uh, well, in what the is the Irish equivocation press. in that? You, you were well, pointing out the equivocation. First of all, it's Where? equivocal because it's not a sentence. Well, now you, you're going out into parsing and into grammarian, well, and like a lot of your, frankly, well, your political your stance, you're becoming academic. Your editorial well, would, you mind telling me, would you mind telling well, me I just uh, I think to move uh, out of the purely academic world uh, into the world of, of uh, activity, political activity, is beneficial in some ways. I think it makes one think in a different set of ways about things, and I think one learns uh, something uh, from that. This is from a 1979 interview on RTE television from Printout. He was taking up his then new position as editor-in-chief of The Observer. He had spent his fifties, a decade, in Irish politics, Doyle and Senate, 
and he was reflecting on some of the main themes of that period. It was also the first decade of the Northern Troubles. I've also enjoyed a lot of things in those years, including the comradeship and friendship of uh, many people uh, in politics. Uh, got to know Ireland a bit better, both uh, north and south, and with the possibility of comparing it with other places. And what have you learned, would you say? That's, uh, ra that's very hard, I think, to put into words. Uh, I, my feeling is of a, a sense of the resistances uh, of historically acquired attitudes and the ingenuity of these attitudes in coming up and dominating people's thoughts. That's to say that even people who think they're talking rationally about a subject, as for example, about the unity of Ireland, about the problems of Northern Ireland, are really much more often than not unconsciously echoing uh, ideas conveyed to them atavistically. I felt the force of those things uh, and uh, have felt a kind of developing sense of tragedy as I experience them. I mean, I, there is some fun in politics some of the time, uh, but there are also forces moving below the surface of politics which are, are not funny, make one anxious for the future, as I am now anxious. Uh, I am concerned with it in part uh, because I have been involved in it uh, in a much earlier phase of my career. Uh, I spoke such words myself and prepared such words for others to speak. And then I began to detach myself a bit from them, to take a step back from them, look at them and say, what are we really saying? You're referring there to your work uh, in the 1948-51 period. You were then a civil servant. That's and... right, yes. I was a councillor in the, uh, on the information side of the Department of External Affairs, as it then was, uh, under uh, Mr. Sean McBride, uh, who uh, was very convinced then uh, of the possibilities of what Departments of Foreign Affairs call information and other people call propaganda as a means uh, towards that end. And in the earlier part of those few years, uh, I shared that enthusiasm uh, and then I became uh, quite disenchanted and disillusioned about that. What I, what I noticed was that whereas what we were supposed to be about was persuading Ulster Protestants of uh, their uh, interest in unity and the place for them in unity, uh, we actually made no real contacts with them and addressed no real words to them. We were addressing other people in the United States and in Britain whom we hoped to be about to apply pressure uh, to Northern Unionists to change uh, their strongly held inherited attitudes. But your doubts at that time, were, were they felt, are you saying, during the course of that work or was it some, some years later when you'd left the country and was work, were working abroad? Uh, I was certainly beginning to feel them uh, during the uh, course of that work uh, and at a later phase of the same work, while I was still working for uh, external affairs, uh, when uh, under the second inter-party government uh, I was in charge of both the political and information uh, side. I urged that in the United Nations the Ireland should concentrate not on uh, political uh, unification or pressure for unification, which I, I saw by then certainly, and this was the mid-50s uh, as entirely negative, uh, but I thought that activity directed uh, at remedying the situation of Catholics in the North and removing their disabilities without pressure for political unity would be legitimate and would stand a chance of getting somewhere, which was in line uh, to some extent with ideas which I believe uh, Sean Lamas certainly uh, had in mind in the years of the rapprochement with uh, Terence O'Neill. And yet would you accept that in the late 40s and 50s, the sort of viewpoint that you finally came to express and have expressed uh, in the last decade in Ireland, that that would have been almost an impossible position to hold uh, if one wants to be successful uh, at the hustings, say, in, in Irish politics? 
Uh, it would, yes, I think, have, they have, have so been. In a sense, the, uh, the Lamas years, uh, too brief though they were, uh, were a bit of a breakthrough uh, in that respect, that it, was, it became possible thereafter to say things that would have be before been uh, uh, so heretical as to be inaudible. And yet, uh, the resistances to that are still very great. It's not that I think that people in Ireland, people in the Republic, have any burning passion for unity. I don't think they have. And in a sense, the words of political men are all the less justifiable because of the tepidity of the, the, the passion. Uh, I think mainly, insofar as in connection with my own electoral defeat, uh, insofar as I was damaged by the issue of the North, it wasn't so much what I was saying, but the fact that I was saying so much about it. Pe those people who reacted in that way, certainly among my own constituents, there weren't very many of them, incidentally, but those who did react were on the line that they didn't want to hear about Northern Ireland. Uh, but, of course, I think mainly their, their frustrations were about the postal services and telephones uh, for which, uh, in those days, uh, I bore the blame. Original programs on which this morning's program was based were by Rodney Rice, Ed Mulhall, Peter McAvoy, David Davenpower, Michael Littleton, Nullig McCarthy, Betty Purcell, Simon Deverley, Mike Murphy, and myself.